I'm now very pleased to be able to introduce to you our expert speaker, Professor Mark Cohen. He's a medical doctor and one of Australia's pioneers of in, um, integrative and holistic medicine. He is currently president of the Australian Will, uh, Australasian Wellness Association and professor of health sciences at RMIT University, where he leads postgraduate wellness programs and supervises research into wellness and holistic health, including research on nutrition, herbal medicine, yoga, meditation, saunas, hot springs, lifestyle, elite athletic performance, and the health impact of pesticides, organic food, and detoxification. In addition to textbooks on herbs and natural supplements and the global spa industry, Professor Cohen has published more than 80 academic papers and written multiple books, chapters and articles on holistic health. His impact on the field has been recognised by four consecutive RMIT Media Star Awards, as well as the inaugural award for leadership and collaboration from the National Institute of Complementary Medicine. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Cohen. Well, thank you, Linda, for the warm invitation, uh, the introduction, and for the invitation to come and speak on this nice, cold Thursday evening. And um, I just wanted to take a trip down memory. Actually, this, preparing this lecture took me down a trip down memory lane because I've been involved with integrative medicine for longer than I care to admit, actually, it's nearly 30 years. And um, you know, Australia has been a leader in this field, and this lecture. Um, that I was asked to, to talk about is you know, the basics. What is complementary medicine? You know, what works? How do we know that it works? How do we find uh, a good practitioner? So these are the questions I was asked to address in this lecture. And I was giving this same lecture 20 years ago when I was um, running a centre for complementary medicine at Monash Medical School. So I went back and revised those notes. And, and not much has changed. I've, I've tried to update some of them, and I've updated the slides, and I've added some more. But this is a lecture that I have been giving for 20 years, although I haven't probably given it for the last 10. So it was really interesting to review the history of complementary medicine throughout Australia. And we really are leaders here with our regulation of, of natural products, with the um, recognition of practitioners, you know, whether it's medical acupuncture or registration of Chinese medicine. And um, in this lecture, I get to actually um, talk about some of the research, but a lot of it's research that I've actually done. So it's been a bit of a trip down memory lane, so thank you for that opportunity. So I want us to start off with a thought for the day that most smiles are started by another smile, and I wanted to kick you off. <laughs> and that's because there's a saying that you know, people won't remember what you've said. They won't remember what you've told them, but they'll remember how you made them feel. So if I make you feel good, there's chances are you'll, you'll remember more. But also, in feeling good, you actually turn on <laughs> the frontal part of your brain, the, the brain that actually awakens you and enlightens you and stimulates you to actually learn more. So hopefully you're, you're all in a good mood to, to start the topic. And the question is, what's in a name? You know, is it complementary medicine, alternative medicine, unconventional, unproven, unorthodox, fringe, integrative, holistic? Um, all of these names are being used interchangeably depending on who's talking and the biases. and, and I'm not going to get caught up on semantics here. And a lot of the documents, the government documents and the, the policy documents and the different medical associations spend you know, pages trying to define each of these terms. But I think you know, there's a general understanding that there's you know, mainstream Western medicine, which is what I studied at medical school, and then there's complementary medicine, which is what I studied when I was doing Chinese medicine and learning about nutrition and herbs and lifestyle. And now I'm focusing on wellness, which embraces all of that, and it muddies the waters a little bit. But really, you know, medicine has one aim, and that's to relieve human suffering. That's what we try and do with medicine, or we try and relieve and prevent disease. So really, there is only medicine that does this, or medicine that doesn't do this. And if you're an economist, and I bet you'll appreciate this, that you want to increase qualities and dallies. Now, a quality is a quality-adjusted life year, and a dally is a disability-adjusted life year. And it's a way that the economists measure life and put a value on it. But it's really the same aim. You want to increase quality adjusted life years, increase 
you know, people's living without a disability, reduce suffering, relieve and prevent disease. That's what we try to do. And to do that, there's different levels of therapeutic intervention. Starting at the top, you know, procedural, you know, surgery, then we've got drugs, we've got different practitioner interventions, certain products you can buy over the counter, personal lifestyle practices, public health um, practices and policies, and finally, whole planetary um, interventions such as addressing greenhouse gas emissions. And as we go down this spectrum, the cost actually reduces. So it's much more expensive to do a procedure where you've got you know, half a dozen people and an anaesthetist, a surgeon, nurses, all focusing on one person that's you know, very expensive, to pharmaceuticals, which are you know, a little bit cheaper but still expensive, down to practitioners' products, you know, personal interventions are getting cheaper, etc. And as you go down, there's also less reliance on the health system, more of a focus on prevention, more focus on personal responsibility and much more sustainability. So that's the, the levels of intervention and complementary medicine fits in the middle there. So complementary medicine really focuses on what, what practitioners do, whether it's you know, massage therapists or you know, TCM practitioners that use themselves as the therapeutic tool, um, products that you can buy at the health food store or the pharmacy, and personal interventions you can just do at home by yourself. That's the realm of complementary medicine. Now the national um, Centre for Complementary and Alternative Medicine in the US also classifies complementary medicines according to these five different domains. So there's philosophical type treatments, which uh, these are um, therapies or medicines that have a whole philosophy behind them. So Ayurveda, which is the Indian, um, traditional Indian philosophy, or traditional Chinese medicine, they have a whole cosmology, a whole um, semantics, a whole language around their therapies. Shamanism, yoga, naturopathy are similar. There's a whole philosophy about it. Mind-body therapies like hypnosis, meditation, relaxation, biofeedback, self-help. Manual therapies, chiropractic and osteopathy, massage, reflexology, shiatsu, acupuncture. Bioenergetic therapies, things like magnetism or pulsed electromagnetic fields. Qigong, Reiki, therapeutic touch and spiritual healing. And medicinal therapies, which are things you take orally usually. Um, so herbs and supplements homeopathy, aromatherapy, and nutritional therapies. So they're, they're the different domains that I'm going to talk about. And I'm also going to talk about how some of them can be blurred. Now, these domains, and it was interesting when the National Institutes of Health in the US set up their Centre for Complementary Medicine, it received in the first year more phone calls than all the other National Institutes of Health at the, uh, put together. You know, the, there's a great demand of interest from the public, and that's because there is a real promise of complementary medicine. Um, great opportunities. You know, it's a miracle cure, truly amazing, works in minutes, guaranteed. And because this is a medical student lecture, there's going to be a lot of mnemonics, these little sort of word um, plays to, to remember them. And, and the opportunities created by complementary medicine are efficacy. One, because it can work. Complementary medicines can be very effective. They can also be very safe. They can be cost effective. They can be adjunctive in that you can use them along with any other therapy that you're doing. They can focus on prevention, and we all know that you know, an ounce of prevention is more, you know, worth more than a pound of cure. They enhance your health, so it's not just about your disease, it's about your overall health. And they enlist the patient's involvement in their own care, which also moves the cost away from the health system, gives self-responsibility, and it actually gives you a more fulfilling life when you're more responsible for your, for your own care. So these are the really significant opportunities uh, offered by complementary and alternative medicines. And the other question is, though, you know, what's in the bottle? What's the miracle cure, the one that, that's truly amazing that the snake oil you know, salesman will try to sell you? Because there are a lot of unkept promises. And how do we sort them out? And that's what I'm going to try and you know, sort of work through with you. And there's a lot of concerns over CAM use. There's a whole organisation, Quackwatch, that you know, lists all the different therapies. And there are concerns that you know, complementary medicines can provide false hope. They can exploit people for money, get them to spend their hard-earned money on things that aren't effective. But there's potential dangers, both from the therapies themselves, plus the interactions with Western medicines. But there's little scientific evidence of their efficacy, that you know, they actually don't work and there's no science to say they do, that does work. And they actually might delay the use of more effective therapies. And these are all you know, really legitimate concerns, but I have to say they're not specific to complementary and alternative medicine. These concerns can be levelled at any form of medicine and you know, I'd suggest before you put anything in your mouth or do any therapy that you 
you know, see what is the expectation? Is there a real hope or a false hope? Um, you know, how much is, is the cost? What are the dangers? What is the evidence? And what are the more effective therapies you might try? So that should be a, you know, these should be a, sort of little bells ringing for any therapy, not just for CAM. The other issues raised by CAM are that there are deficiencies in conventional medicine. There's a lot of people walking around who've been fully treated by the best specialists and the best doctors and the surgeons and, the, and drugs, and they're still in pain and they're still suffering. We don't know everything in medicine. So there's, you know, these people are searching for something. Often there is an inadequate doctor-patient relationship, and that occurs not just with the, the level of communication that happens, but also the time that's involved with that. That um, patients often want to initiate their own treatment. They go to Dr Google, and then they do their own treatment, and that you know, raises issues. Patients desire a natural approach, although patients can also be gullible and they, have, they lack the knowledge to actually discern what's real and what's not. And also the public are demanding optimal health, preventing disease and ageing, and more autonomy and involvement in their own care. So these are, I mean, some of these are good issues. I mean, we want the public to be more involved. We want people to have more autonomy and, and prevent disease and optimise their health. But really, to sort out these other issues, it's, it's challenging. In Australia, we know, and the statistics, these are still old statistics, and I tried to get updated statistics on some of these slides, but um, some I was able to, some I wasn't. But we know that at least more than 50% of Australians use complementary medicine products. It's probably more 70 or 80%, depending on the, the data you read. More than 20% of Australians see complementary medicine practitioners. The, the spending's approximated to about $3.5 billion, and in various times, four times the amount of out-of-pocket out of spending on pharmaceuticals, and that's not because that pharmaceuticals are cheaper. We spend a lot more on pharmaceuticals, but most of them are subsidised, so we pay via our taxes through the PBS. And the other issue is that a lot of people don't tell their doctors. Most people who have been so they don't tell their doctors about or fully disclose the complementary medicines they use. And um, I did some research in the past with one of my colleagues, who's now um, the head of the Blackmores Research Institute. That's Leslie Braun. She was a pharmacist and a naturopath. And we did some research together, and she showed that a lot of inpatient use isn't charted. So patients who are going into hospitals, you know, they have all their drugs on the drug chart, and they're all recorded and administered by the, well, actually, they're prescribed by the doctor, and um, delivered by the pharmacist, and administered by the nurse, and it's all very recorded. But then, next to the, in the drawer next to their bed, they have their, their medicines, their herbs and supplements, and. Um, things they bought at the health food shop that no one's recording whether they're taking it or not. It's actually not charted or, or used. And it's this policy of you know, don't ask, don't tell, don't know. So the doctors don't want to ask because they don't know what to do with it and the patients don't want to tell them because they, they're a bit embarrassed by it. And that's actually not good for anybody. The, the best form of medicine is we have full disclosure, they have a team approach and people know what's happening. So this is some other research I did. This was published in 2005, so it's a little bit old now. <clears throat> and we did a national survey of GPs, and we asked them about their thoughts about complementary alternative medicines. And the data basically showed, I don't know if you can read that bottom line there, but there were three general categories. The, the blue line is the, the therapies that they thought were effective, and the um, pink line there is the therapies they thought were, is their level of safety. And there were three classes. There was the non-medicinal, high effective, and low harm therapies. And they were acupuncture, massage, meditation, yoga, and hypnosis. So most doctors thought they were very effective, more, you know, about 70, 80% effective, and very safe. Then there was the middle group, which were medicinal or manipulative therapies that doctors thought were moder moderately effective and potentially harmful. So things like chiropractic, uh, osteopathy, Chinese herbal medicine, herbal medicine, vitamin and mineral therapy, naturopathy, and homeopathy. So doctors weren't as sure about them. They thought maybe they can be harmful. And, and especially because a lot of doctors don't know about the ingestible complementary therapies and they can often interact with drugs. And that's always a warning bell because often it's not the, the complementary medicine that's causing the problem, it's the enhanced toxicity of the pharmaceuticals. And there's a lot of interactions there we have to be careful about. So doctors were a bit more cautious about this group. And finally, there was a last group which were considered esoteric. They weren't, they weren't harmful, but they're not really effective either. And there were things like spiritual healing, aromatherapy, and reflexology. Now, this is just doctors' opinions. And it's interesting, when you look at this group, it really depends on the therapy and how you sort of market it. Because something like massage, which was considered very effective and very safe, a lot of massage therapists actually practice aromatherapy or Reiki or reflexology. 
So, you know, it, doctors didn't really know much about this esoteric group, but they, they considered them sort of harmless and if patients want to try it, it's probably not going to work, but why not? So that's just to give you an overview of the, the landscape at least 10 years ago of what doctors thought about CAM therapies. And there are significant professional barriers between doctors and um, complementary therapists, and I've sort of been on both sides of that, uh, that debate, and often you know, I like to consider you know, myself as a bridge there. But there are significant philosophical and conceptual differences. It's hard for a doctor to talk to a Chinese medicine practitioner when they're talking about liver chi and damp heat, and the doctor's talking about you know, anatomy and physiology and um, you know, pharmacotherapy. There's different terminology between disciplines, just as I've mentioned. Um, there's a lot of bias and jealousies and a lack of knowledge and respect between the two. So there's just outright ignorance, and when you don't know what's going on, you know, there's this sort of animosity that happens. There's a lack of registration of many complementary medicine practitioners, and even though Victoria was a, a world leader in registering Chinese medicine practitioners before they were APRA registered, and that was the first um, state or government regulation of Chinese medicine practitioners outside of China. Um, the fact that there are a lot of therap therapies, you know, like naturopathy and massage therapy, aren't formally registered means doctors aren't really sure about them, and it, it creates a, a significant barrier. And that there's a lack of collaborative models and standards of how do we work together as therapists. Um, there's issues of vicarious liability. If I refer to a complementary therapist and they do something wrong, as a doctor, am I blamed? And there's precedents that say maybe that's the case. So there's a lot of uncertainties between these two divisions of Western medicine and complementary medicine. And certainly, and very importantly, there's different funding models. You know, doctors, we get to access Medicare, or that's, you know, that's been um, you know, chipped away at over the last 20 years. But um, complementary therapists are appealing directly to the public. And you know, there's a whole different funding model of who can afford and what can they afford and how is it subsidised. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Now, one of the big questions I, I get asked all the time is, how do you choose a good practitioner? And often I just say, you know, people often get the practitioner they deserve. Because it's really hard to say how, you know, who is going to be right for you. But there's some general principles you can follow. One is the philosophy of the practitioner, if they mesh with your own personal philosophy. And we all have our biases, you know, that would make us go to a, either a Chinese practitioner, or an Ayurvedic practitioner, or a yoga, or a naturopath. So we have our own philosophy that guides us. Then we have recommendations and rapport. You know, whoever recommends that therapist, and if your surgeon or your doctor recommends someone or the neighbour next door or the person in the supermarket queue recommends someone, you might take the recommendations with a different a weight. But recommendations are often, word of mouth is a very strong indicator or um, motivator to go and see someone. And then when you've seen them, the rapport that you have with the practitioner, it's really important no matter if it's your doctor or your complementary therapist, that you're able to speak to them. You actually have a good rapport and you're able to connect with them and share your life and your issues so they can help you. So that's really important. And then access. Can you actually get access to them? You know, they booked out for six months. Are they unaffordable? Are they so expensive? Because a lot of the really good practitioners, you can't get in to see them or they're, they're too expensive. So that's, you know, access is a big issue. And finally, what are their credentials? What are their university qualifications? But also, what is their experience? And some people, you know, they specialise in cancer or they specialise in women's health or they specialise in sports medicine. And that's true in both Western medicine and complementary medicine. So you want to look at, you know, what, do, what is their experience? You know, their qualifications might be 20 years ago, but what are they doing now and who do they, you know, who do they treat and what success do they get? And then finally, and I think most importantly, is the teamwork. Who do they work with? Who do they collaborate with? No matter what sort of practitioner you are, I mean, certainly, I mean, I trained as a GP as well as other things, but you, know, you need a big fat referral pad and you need to refer really widely and um, you know, to, a, to a range of, of needs. So if your patient comes with needs, if you can't fulfil them, you should know who can and work in a team. And that makes you much safer as your practitioner to know your scope of practice, but it also then fulfils the needs of your patients. So I think that often you know, I say, you know, is that a good practitioner? Who do they work with? Who refers to them? Um, which makes them a safer practitioner. It's more rewarding for the practitioner, but also for their patients. And then, once you've chosen a practitioner, how do you choose between different therapies? And here's another mnemonic piece, which is, one is, again, personal preferences. You know, do you prefer herbs or massage or yoga or what, what you're going to prefer? What is the evidence? 
And I'll talk a bit more about evidence, but here the evidence is, you know, what is the evidence that that therapy is going to do more good than harm? Because hopefully you want to have therapies that are going to help you rather than hurt you. Then what are the alternatives? Well, this therapy might be okay, but what, what else is there? Are there more effective therapies, safer therapies, cheaper therapies that actually might work for you? So you need to look at what is the whole range of, of alternatives. And often, you know, one you know, therapist will say, you know, this works and it's really good and here's the evidence for it. But they don't say, yeah, well, this works, but there's all these other ones that would work just equally as well, but we don't offer that. So you really, as a consumer, you want to know what, what, what are your options. Oh, don't know what happened there. And then looking at the costs and the benefits. And the costs isn't just the financial cost, it's the cost in terms of time, it's the cost in terms of potential risks that it's going to cause you, you know, suffering or pain. You know, if, if, if you've got a, um, uh, a very serious disease, you're going to pay more or risk more than if you've got a you know, very slight disease. And then what are the benefits? So, for example, you know, that, that is very different if you've got cancer and you're willing to have chemotherapy and have the, the cost of the time and losing your hair and, and the nausea of chemotherapy, but the benefit is it saves your life, potentially. Um, or then a therapy like meditation, where it doesn't really cost much, a bit of time each day, and the benefits might not be as evidence-based, but the benefits are potentially good, and you know, if it doesn't cost you much and the benefits are, are there, why not do it? So everybody has a different cost-benefit um, analysis that they have in their own personal life, and that needs to be considered. Then finally, expedience, which comes down to that access issue. You know, what's available? What do you need right now? You know, what's accessible to you? I mean, maybe Tibetan medicine's the best thing for you, but if you have to go to Tibet to get it, maybe it's not available. So, you know, if you're on the side of the road, you have whatever first aid people can administer to you, even though there's something else that you know, someone else could do better. So you really have to be expedient with your life and, and you know, work with your resources that are available. So the, this is sort of an ongoing equation. And this, these five things, I think, are all really almost equally important to consider when you're choosing amongst therapies. But as policy makers, as doctors, as professional associations, the one we focus on is evidence. Because that's the one that's in the textbooks, that's the thing that's in the medical journals, that's the thing that companies pay a lot of, you know, millions or many more to um, do research on, to get it accredited, that then you have foundations like MOVE, you know, Muscle, Bone and Joint Health um, Australia to recommend, you know, when there's evidence. And as I say, the evidence is that it's going to do more good than harm. Now, a big change happened in Australia in about 2002 where Karen Phelps, who was then, she was the first women, woman president of the AMA, um, developed the AMA position statement on complementary um, medicine and she said, as evidence emerges that some complementary medicines are effective, it becomes ethically impossible for the medical profession to ignore them. And I remember that well, this is AMA, the Integrative Medicine Association, I was the president of that association at the time. And I was for eight years and actually when Karen stepped down from being the president of the AMA, she stepped into my role as the president of AMA for a few years. But that's a big statement because it says that you know, if there is evidence that complementary medicines work, then doctors have to think about them and include them. It becomes really ethically challenging for them to ignore them and say, oh, I didn't study that, I didn't study herbs in medical school, I don't know about it, I don't have to know about it. Well, if they work, then doctors need to know about it. Otherwise, they're depriving their patients of a safe and effective therapy. And even though that seems like an obvious statement, that, that's really challenging for doctors because suddenly doctors, their range of knowledge, I mean, you know, when I studied medicine, it was six years full time. They've actually reduced that, but now there's five year training afterwards or four years training afterwards. It's increased the scope of knowledge that doctors have to have incredibly. So this is like a short list of the different complementary therapies that are out there. So how can a doctor possibly even know the names of all these therapies and know about them, let alone know which ones work for which medical conditions in which patients? So then that begs the question, you know, how much can doctors be expected to know about complementary and alternative medicine? They're not taught about it in medical school. And to know, even just to know that list, as I say, let alone which conditions and which patients they're going to work, is, you know, it boggles the mind. So, at that, you know, again, around the early 2000s, um, I was president of AMA and the College of GPs got together and we came up with a, a, a position, there was actually an RACB, RACGP, which is the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, and AMA, the Australasian Integrative Medicine Association, we had a working party to work out how do doctors navigate this maze. And we came up with this position statement, and it's on, it's on the web, 
and it says the key principle of evidence-based medicine should be the basis for evaluating natural and complementary medicines and their use by the medical profession. And it should also be the basis for any collaborative relationships between general practitioners and complementary therapists. So that was an important statement to say evidence is the way we look at it. But then, this is evidence-based medicine, there's a hierarchy. And you can have evidence to say, can it work? Which is evidence of efficacy. Does it work? Which is effectiveness. Is it worth it? Efficiency or cost effectiveness? Is it safe? And how does it work? And then you can have case series, you can have comparative studies, you can have randomised control trials, up to systematic reviews of randomised control trials, which is this evidence hierarchy. So again, the evidence creates a bit of a maze to navigate. And then a lot of therapies are like this. I think you should be more explicit here in step two, where then a miracle occurs. And even a lot of drugs are like that. We don't know how anaesthetics work. You know, we know the background pharmacology of it, and we know sort of roughly in the brain where they work, but somewhere in that a miracle occurs, and we don't really know the, the whole chain of, of causation. So you know, evidence you know, can be directed at different parts of the equation. Now, where can you find evidence? Well, certainly search engines. Um, you know, Google Scholar and PubMed now have indexes of all the different medical trials, although you need a PhD to navigate them. There's so many studies. Um, the Cochrane database is great, which is only, but it's only systematic reviews of randomised control trials. And they do have public um, statements and summaries for consumers. There's different source articles you know, on the web and journal sites and li the libraries. And there's textbooks. And I've, you know, Leslie Braun, who I mentioned, we did, we did this research. We, 14 years ago, we wrote this book on herbs and natural supplements, an evidence-based guide. And at that time, it was 400 pages. And it was, a, it, it was you know, nominated for a scholarly award for you know, Australian publishing. And then three years later, they wanted to update it. So we updated it, and the next edition had 800 pages. And, and we had to you know, get some other helpers. And then we did the third edition, it had 1,200 pages. And earlier this year, we brought out the fourth edition, and it's now in two volumes, and it's 1,600 pages. And we have added a few more chapters, but the, re the amount of research over the last 14 years on different complementary therapies has just expanded dramatically. So chapters on certain herbs that were you know, maybe 20 or 30 studies 14 years ago are now 130 studies. So it's been really challenging for us to you know, to keep abreast of it, but that, that is a standard textbook. In fact, a lot of the content of this lecture I wrote in one of the original chapters in that early textbook that sort of stayed, um, stayed true over those four editions. So there, I mean, there is information in textbooks, but you know, evidence is a moving feast, um, and it, you have to sort of keep on top of it, of the, of the literature. There's also evidence from yourself, and there's a classic N of one study, where you can use, your, you know, use yourself as your own control, you can define the treatment goals, you can make a journal and assess the success of that treatment, and then you can blind or double blind the treatment, so you can have different um, uh, medicines that you don't even know what you're taking, and then record your pain, and then do an, the next one in association with your practitioner or doctor, and work out, does it work for you? Because ultimately that's what's important. It doesn't matter what happened in a controlled trial in some other country, in this population where they excluded um, people on multiple drugs, they excluded pregnant women, and they excluded people with you know, complicated organ system disease. You want to know what's relevant to you, and N of 1 trials are a legitimate way to do that. I can tell we're going to run out of time in this lecture, but we'll keep going. Also, we have to realise that there are limitations of evidence. That a lack of evidence of an effect does not mean there's evidence for lack of an effect. And there are certain therapies that will never have treatment, or never have evidence. I remember when I was in Sri Lanka studying acupuncture, one of the treatments they did for acute asthma was they put a needle in the sternal notch and shoved it right under the sternum. And for an acute asthma attack, and it was actually dramatic to watch a patient who had a needle shoved all the way under their sternum, which stimulates the, the, the bronchi, the, you know, the bronchial tubes and the, the um, autonomic nerves around that. And over the next five minutes, they'd sit there comfortably and the needle would gradually work its way out and their breathing would relax and they'd recover from an acute asthma attack. Now, there's no ethics committee in the world that will ever approve a study of putting a needle in the sternal notch for someone with an acute asthma attack, which is a potentially fatal condition that we have drugs to treat, even though people still die from asthma attacks, even with drug treatment. So that's never going to have evidence. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. Um, and there's a lot of treatments like that, that you know, the, the, tr the things we do research on are the things that researchers are interested in or companies are interested in paying, but it's not necessarily um, all the different treatments that are available. So before we think about surgical removal, we'll try putting you on ca chamomile tea for a few weeks and see what happens. 
so even though there's not evidence for everything, we have to sort of be reasonable. How do we, how do we decide what to do in these situations? You know, there's, I don't know, there's no randomised control trial of removing horns from people. So, you know, what, what do you do about that? And for most of the conditions, I must say, when you go to the Cochrane reviews or the evidence, what the conclusion is inconclusive. We need more research. It's very rare that we actually have conclusive evidence that something works or doesn't work. And we need to know that research and clinical practice are actually different. And the conditions and therapies that we do research on um, do not reflect what's actually done in practice. So we do research on therapies that have a commercial advantage or can be standardised, but what happens in practice? You know, purvilists do a bit of that and acupuncturists do a bit of needles here and there and you know, it's really variable because medicine ultimately is personalised, yet when we do research we put everything into protocols and standardise it. So there's different priorities. We also realise that patients are people first and each one is different with respect to their genes, their physiology, their past experience, their social circumstances, their resources, all of these things, their lifestyle and the values that they place on health. So we really need to personalise any therapy according to who, who we're treating. And then I've been on both sides, I've been a patient, I've been a doctor and I've been a researcher and there's different priorities. As a researcher, we focus on questions. As a doctor, we want to focus on solutions. That happened again. Um, so, the, you know, a researcher asks questions, a cl clinician seeks solutions. Researchers focus on populations. Clinicians focus on individuals. Researchers want to reduce bias and reduce the placebo effect. Clinicians want to increase bias and, and maximise the placebo effect to make their patients feel better. Placebo means I will please. As a practitioner, we want to please our patients. Researchers, we look at single therapy. Clinicians, multiple therapies. And researchers want objective outcomes and clinicians want patient outcomes. So there's actually a different priority and again, it comes up to us as individuals of where we look at our own priorities. And here's a guy who's addicted to placebos, but he'd give them up, but it wouldn't make any difference. Different therapies can be looked at on the spectrum of evidence, efficacy, safety and use, and even cost there. So you can have a therapy that's like the red one here that's it's not effective, the evidence is equivocal, it's very safe and very widely used. Another therapy that might be very effective, it's got traditional evidence, but no good control evidence, it's very, very safe, but it's not used at all. And there's probably many traditional therapies that are like that. They're very safe, they're very effective, we don't use them because there's no evidence. And there might be other therapies, such as this yellow one, where it's very effective, or it's highly effective, or so that, yeah, highly effective, good evidence, but it's not very safe. It's actually quite unsafe, but it's still widely used because we have evidence and it's effective. So any therapy can be looked at in these spectrums, and we have to do that assessment for ourselves with everything we look at. So I'm making it more complicated for you, aren't I? It's not just giving you the answers. I'm just giving you the questions. You have to find your own answers. And this is another little assessment. So the efficacy and safety, the so things that are on the right-hand side here are things that work, and the things that are on the top half are the things that are safe. So the things that work and safe you want to encourage, and the things that, the, that don't work and aren't safe you want to discourage. And then you want to tolerate and reassess the ones that, you know, they, they're safe but they might work and you want to discourage and reassess the ones that are unsafe, even though they, they could work. So there's another you know, matrix of looking at different therapies. But really, complementary medicine has a different approach to conventional medicine. And this is where I sort of made a turn in my career. About 16 years ago, where I'd been a, a medical doctor at, working at Monash Medical School, and I was the alternative doctor amongst the conservative medical establishment there, and I was invited to go to RMIT, and head up their, cent or their department of complementary medicine at the time, which was osteopathy, chiropractic and Chinese medicine. So I became the conservative medical doctor amongst the alternative doctors. And I'm still at RMIT now, we're in our School of Health Sciences. But at that time, I really changed my own focus to a wellness approach from an illness approach. And if you look at wellness and illness as a spectrum, you can break that up into different areas. So below, below a certain defined line, there's ill health. We define that line by a symptom pattern, a blood pressure reading, a blood sugar reading, the ways we define disease. Then we have average health, and then there's a less well-defined line above which we have enhanced health. And Western medicine really focuses on that line. It gets sick people back to average, so they stop complaining. Complementary medicine, on the other hand, moves people up from wherever they are. 
So there's a lot of complementary medicines that do get sick people back to average, but many complementary medicines and therapies are used by average people to give them enhanced health. And I would, I would sort of argue that everyone with enhanced health uses things in their, in their general lifestyle that we would sort of consider the realms of complementary therapies. Now, this line here is solid because we define it by, a, as I say, a pathology reading, a blood pressure reading, a blood sugar reading. This is a very dotted line because it's very hard to define the multiple dimensions of wellness. But what we do know is the higher up you go, the greater your resilience, the greater your flexibility of response, and also the further you've got to fall. So being high up on this spectrum is the best prevention. It's also the most fun. You can do the most with your life when you're, when you're very well, when you've got a, a lot of ability to respond. And there's certainly things that bring us down. We call them stressors, you know, it's aging and accidents and financial stress and personal stress. We all have them. What we don't focus on enough, I think, is the blissors, the things that move us up, the things that give us, you know, rise us to enhanced health. And ultimately, our life is a balance. You know, where we end up on this spectrum is a balance between the things that pull us up and the things that drag us down. And that, you know, that sum total depends on where we sort of float in this area here. But wherever we are, there's a central axis. And that's what I like to call the deep inner well of our being. That still point that, we're, that we reach in meditation. Some people call it the soul. Some people call it um, the atma, the... the, the the, the centre of our being that all action comes from. So that, that is there whether, when we, whether we die or not. Or, or, sorry. Um, so that's our core. And really finding that core helps you to react from wherever you are. There's a lovely story about um, Swami Satchitananda, who's a yoga guru, who was asked about the difference between illness and wellness. And he went up to the lecture and just drew a circle around the eye in illness and the we in wellness and went and sat down. And it really is that. When you're sick, it's all about me. It's like, what treatments do I need? What therapists can I have? When you're well, it's about we. What can we do together? What can I contribute? What can I give? And it's very outward looking. And that's, it's a shift in focus that's actually really rewarding. And this is a model that I developed 20 years ago at the Monash Medical School when I was talking about complementary therapies. It talks about the five activities that complement health. That's stress management, exercise, nutrition, social spiritual interaction and education. As you can see, it makes sense. You know, you can't argue against that. But also, you can do any of those things and you'll enhance your health. You'll move up that spectrum. And any of those things can also be added to any other therapy that you're going to do. So they literally complement other therapies and they complement your health. But all of those things need to be done by you. Because as a doctor, I can't manage your stress. I can't exercise for you, I can't eat for you, I can't interact with the nature or, or other people for you. I may be able to educate you. In fact, the word doctor comes from the, the Latin docere, to teach. So really the best thing we can do as doctors is actually to teach people. But this is what I call the pillars of complementary medicine. That you could, you know, they're very safe, they're very effective, they add to anything else you do, and you'll notice exercise and movement is a big part of that. So this was what a stable health system would look like. Wellness activities on the bottom, general care, acute care and intensive care, and you'd spend most money on wellness and at least on in, you know, intensive care. Um, it's a great idea. Unfortunately, that's the system we've got, where we spend most of our money on intensive care and acute care, and about 1% of the health budget goes on prevention and, and wellness activities. And as you can see, all around the world, it's going to fall over. And currently we have a, you know, a crisis in, in global health spending and national health spending and, and chronic disease, etc. So, you know, what, what are we going to do about that? And it's really this wellness approach that's needed. So what is wellness? And there's many definitions. Harmony between internal and external worlds. The state where you look, feel, perform and stay well. The constant conscious pursuit of living life to its fullest potential being fully present in the moment so that actions flow naturally and authentically from the deep inner well of your being. And it, it's the point where you experience the greatest fulfilment and enjoyment from life and achieve the greatest longevity. These are different definitions, but everybody wants that. Unfortunately, the medical profession doesn't know much about it. So here you've got someone with a rare condition called good health, and frankly, we don't know how to treat it. And we didn't, as a medical student, um, and even as a doctor, I didn't learn much about wellness. I learned a lot about illness. 
and it's a really it's a different focus. But we know that wellness is multi-dimensional. It's not just one dimension. It's you know physical, psychological, sexual, emotional, social, cultural, spiritual, educational, occupational. The list goes on. Um, I'm now head of the Australasian Wellness Association, and what we say is it's all about connection. And that's connection with yourself, connection with your environment, connection with your community, connection with all of nature. So that's, you know, wellness is really focused on connection. And this is a, another model I've come up with, which is I call the wellness pyramid. And it's, if you write these words on a processor and centre them, they form a nice triangle. And it's to, just to be, relax, exercise, eat good food and share your feelings. And it's not a coincidence that share your feelings is a foundation. It seems like a law of... Uh, emotions is when you share joy, it increases, and when you share pain, it decreases. You know, the greatest joys and the greatest tribulations we have in life are with other people. It's not about pills and potions and possessions. So sharing your feelings is so important. Then eating good food, exercising, relaxing and being, and these all express connections. Sharing your feelings is connection with people. Eating good food is your connection with nature. In fact, it's our greatest connection with nature is through our diet. Exercise is connection with our body, relaxation is connection with our mind, and just being is our connection with the universe. So it's all about connection, and, and if we can you know, live according to, you know, you talk about dietary pyramids and dietary things, this is the wellness pyramid that I, I, I would recommend for, for being well. Now, I was going to talk a little bit, now I'll have to skip through some of these slides, I've got 15 minutes to go through another half hour of a lecture. But I'm um, talking about osteoarthritis and you know, what are some of the complementary therapies that could treat it? We know it's a major cause of disability. Three million Australians suffer from it. There's no curative therapies. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the most common script in Australia and often there for arthritis. And complementary medicines can be at least as effective. Now, these are the medical interventions, non-pharmacological, pharmacological and surgery. So drugs and surgery with some exercise. There's a lot of different complementary therapies and I'm going to just go through a short list here. And it's interesting, when there's a lot of different therapies for a disease, it usually means that none of them really work. Because if there was one that really worked, you wouldn't need all of them. <laughs> but but you know, with so many people with arthritis that, and it's not curable, there's one of these therapies that will work, hopefully, for everybody. So for the philosophical therapies, yoga is an important one, and the BKS Iyengar, even in his you know, late you know, 80s, was able to do incredible feats with his um, bone and joint health. And it's often prescribed as a therapy for arthritis and for back pain, etc. You don't have to be a pretzel to do yoga. There's a lot of different approaches. Um, nature care is really important. Just being in nature, and there was a, a Victorian report, Healthy Parks, Healthy People, that actually came out and said, access to nature plays a vital role in human health and wellbeing and development that has not been fully recognised, and that the positive effects of, of, on human health particularly in urban environments, cannot be overstated. Our connection with nature is so important. Um, and that's the whole nature care that is the foundation for naturopathy. And another therapy that I really love, and getting into hot water, is um, hot spring bathing or balnea therapy. And we happen to have a, a magnificent facility in Rye, an hour drive south, um, Peninsula Hot Springs. And we know magnesium is very well absorbed through the skin. Um, it's really good for muscle health. And that you can actually satisfy multiple um, needs. So you can, you know, you get the heat and you get the minerals, but you also, you're in nature, immersed in nature, and you can be talking with friends. So you're doing these multiple therapies all in the one, you know, social occasion. You don't go there for therapy, you go there for fun, and therapy is just a side effect. Um, and just to have to give a plug, on the July 20th, I'm giving a lecture. There's a um, dine and bathe um, session at the hot springs and um, move muscle, bone and joint health um, are running that um, next month. So mind-body therapies, you've probably heard a lot about meditation, I'm not going to have time to go into the details, but you know, very effective for chronic pain. Um, and in mind-body therapies, they all you know, aim to achieve this state of flow. And this Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, he's a very famous psychologist who has been researching flow states for many decades now, he says, he calls the flow state a joyous, self-forgetful involvement through, connect, through concentration, which is in turn is made possible by a discipline of the body. So a flow state is when your mind and your body are meshed in the single activity. I'm going to go through this very quickly. And roughly, we all have challenges and we all have skills. 
So when our challenges are really high but our skills are low, we're really anxious. If our, skill, you know, if our challenges are really low and our skills are really high, we're relaxed or bored. And when our challenges are really high and our skills are really high to meet them, we achieve this flow state. And that's because when you're up here, you don't have any capacity to worry about the past or you know, fret about the future. You're totally engaged in what you're doing because you've got a really high challenges. Um, and what happens throughout our life, at least what I've experienced throughout my life, as I get older, my capacity increases. So I actually need more challenges to reach that flow state. Because, you know, first of all, walking was a challenge. And then we, then we got bored with walking, we wanted to do other things. So as we go through life, we, want to, we need challenges. We need to rise to the occasion, otherwise we're, we're apathetic, bored, or just relaxed. We want to be in control, but ultimately in that flow state. So that's the, the aims mind-body activities. And another great favourite of mine is dancing. And dancing is a flow state. You can easily achieve that. But dancing, out of all the therapies, and there's, there's a little bit of research, not a lot of good research, but one um, study um, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a 21-year prospective study of people over 75, and they found that, da um, found that dancing, but not other physical activity, was associated with lower risk of dementia. So moving your body, especially in partner dancing, was actually really effective for, for mental health as well as muscle, bone and joint health. Manual therapies, we can talk about massage. This is actually a systematic review that I was involved with of all of massage therapy. It was done at, um, uh, by myself and a colleague, um, um, Kenny Ong. Um, and we, we did a whole systematic review of massage therapy for different conditions. And there was limited evidence for massage therapy for musculoskeletal conditions, acute low back pain, neck arm and shoulder fibromyalgia um, pain, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, myofascial pain, knee osteoarthritis, temperate mandibular joint dysfunction. And it's interesting because these were randomised controlled trials. And it's really hard to do randomised controlled trials of massage. I mean, placebo massage is not that easy to, de to, to devise and you know, there's not a lot of money to pay for randomised controlled trials of massage. So this systematic review um, was it's interesting. There was quite a bit of research that was done and it is very effective. But then massage is about touch. And you know, we said, I said before, it's all about connection. Well, touch involves physical connection and mechanical forces. Sure, you move blood around and lymphatics around. It's also about sensation, pain and pleasure. But it's also about emotional connection, in intimacy, empathy. There's an exchange of information that happens. Communication and presence is transferred through touch. And then there's also an energetic exchange. Heat and electromagnetic radiation, and even subtle energies can gets transferred through touch. So there's many things going on when we touch other people. And in fact, touch is the only sense that we have as humans that if we don't have it, we die. Like if a human infant is not touched, it will, it will literally die. Yet, you know, you can live happily without your ears or your um, sense of sight or, or smell, etc. So does the doctor hug? <laughs> and this issue of touch and skin hunger, and this is a great quote here, hunger, that's what it feels like, a craving for human contact, an aching need to be touched by a compassionate human being, be it a hug, a warm hand on an arm, or a gentle back massage. However, unlike belly hunger, skin hunger doesn't rumble for attention. It may even masquerade as depression, hallucinations, moodiness, anxiety, irritability, boredom and pain, and many other symptoms or states of mind that can be mistakenly attributed to disease or physical conditions. Now, we live in a very low-touch society. You can get arrested for touching someone the wrong way. You can get you know, fired from your job for touching someone the wrong way. We have all these co you know, taboos and codes around who can touch it. And massage therapists and doctors and other therapists literally have a licence to touch. Yet touch is, we need it all, and very um, often we suffer from skin hunger, and especially people with mental illness, often the elderly, and, and strangely enough, often adolescents um, are starved for touch. And it is so therapeutic. So, you know, you know, manual therapies, just the act of touching can be really powerful. Okay, I'm going to go fast now. Bioenergetic therapy is another research that I was involved with. Um, some years ago, of looking at electromagnetic pads. I did a second, I did a PhD in Chinese medicine and a second one in electrical engineering. Mm. And this is the results from some research we did where we, we, we lived, I, I still feel bad to this day, we, we almost crippled people. We got them to walk downhill backwards for an hour. 
And the idea was to get them to stretch their, their calf muscles while they're contracting their calf muscles. So downhill backwards walking is called eccentric exercise. It's, it sort of reproduces a sports injury. But what happened, the next, and you get this what's called delayed onset muscle soreness. And we thought it would, you know, they'd get you know, quite severe pain. They had pain seven or eight out of ten. Um, you know, they, literally the next day they couldn't walk. And we had these mats and we had some of the mats that were switched off. They couldn't tell if they were working and others that you know, they were working. And we did it for a few days and certainly electromagnetic fields gave them great pain relief and greater recovery. I'm not going to go into that. But there's, uh, you know, and I know with arthritis, you know, magnets and be um, magnetic beds and pads and copper things have been used for many, many years. And some people swear by them, other people think there's no you know, no benefit at all. So again, it's, you know, the cost isn't a lot, the benefits may be good, um, the, the risks aren't very high, so you could try it. Now I'm going to, I've got a bit more time, I'll spend a bit of time on medicinal therapies, but, and I've just sort of tried to focus on the highlights. So phytodolore is one of the, the most researched herbal therapies. It's been used in Europe for 40 years, millions and millions of patients have received it, um, it's one of the most researched herbal therapies, as I said. Um, there's no reports of adverse effects, and there's systematic reviews of multiple randomised controlled trials that show that, that show that there is little doubt that phytodolore is a safe and effective treatment of musculoskeletal pain. Yet, there's, this evidence has been around. How many people have heard of phytodolore before? See, one out of a, you know, a hundred. Um, so, yeah, so she, and she's from Germany. So in Germany and in Europe, this is sort of standard. Yet in Australia, even though this is safe, it's effective, um, you know, there's no adverse effects, um, it's not widely known. Um, this is a study that I did as well, a double-blind control trial of topical treatments. Of, um, this was glucosamine, chondroitin and cancer cream, which also had good, positive effects. And this is something that I've become very interested in. This is food as medicine. And... I'm giving the example here of turmeric, and there's a lot of reasons that turmeric is just an amazing herb. But you can have turmeric as a herb, and you put it in your curry. And usually, when you have it as food, you don't have turmeric alone. You have it with cumin and black pepper and ginger, and you, know, you, you have a whole herbal bay leaves, and you have a big herbal mix. And you have you know, Indians have it every day. It's the yellow spice and turmeric root. You buy it at the grocer. You can also buy it at the supermarket and powder. And most Indian mothers would have a formula or a recipe for golden milk, which is usually it's ghee or coconut oil or milk because you need fat to absorb turmeric, with turmeric and some ginger and some black pepper and herbs. And it's a health tonic when they, when they get a bit sick, they have golden milk. So it's, it's not every day maybe, but it's like a tonic. But now we also have turmeric in capsules. And there's straight turmeric in capsules which can be had as a medicine. And now there's even more bioavailable turmeric because turmeric, the curcumin, which is the very active anti-inflammatory um, part of turmeric, where there's, I think there's 5,000 or more scientific studies done on turmeric. It's very, very well researched. Um, it's got you know, very, very powerful anti-inflammatory properties, but it's very poorly absorbed. So now there's highly bioavailable forms that um, have been nanoparticleized, etc. So you can have it in a capsule, or there's forms where it's, it's put in with other, other herbs as a medicine. Now, when you have it as a medicine, it's more expensive and it's more concentrated, but you're taking it with a specific aim. So when in the spectrum, oh, when, is this, when in the spectrum does turmeric become, move from being a food to a medicine? I mean, I have a recipe for popcorn. I put coconut oil and turmeric into a big pot, cook it up with popcorn, and it makes the, the traditional like yellow popcorn with some salt. The kids love it. You can have turmeric every day, eating popcorn and um, putting it in, in your curries. So that's something you can have prevention every day. But if you've, got a, if you've got serious pain or inflammation that you want to treat, you're much better off taking turmeric as a, as a medicinal um, uh, tablet than you would for a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And one of the things is that turmeric is not only good for anti-inflammatory, it's actually good for wound healing. So rather than causing gut ulcers, it heals gut ulcers. It actually improves your microbiome. So it actually makes the gut bacteria, the good gut bacteria, stronger and the, and the bad gut bacteria weaker in, in our guts. There's so many multiple benefits and there's no adverse effects. You don't overdose. There's no, there's no serious adverse effects from turmeric. So it's something you can all try 
you know, experimenting with different recipes and having it at home on a regular basis, but it can also be a medicine, and this is this spectrum. And it's really the intention that you take it and the dose that you take it, um, whether, whether it is a medicine or just a part of everyday life. This is opposed to non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and this is straight from the Better Health Channel, and to remember that they're commonly used to manage um, the pain and inflammation associated with arthritis and other musculoskeletal disorders. These are the most prescribed drugs in Australia. But they can cause serious side effects, some of which may be life-threatening. They should always be used cautiously for the shortest possible time, and always talk to your doctor or pharmacist before buying or taking the NSAIDs to ensure it's safe for you to take. Now, I couldn't get updated data on the, the side effects of non-steroidals, but um, which therapy would you take for OA if you've got turmeric and non-steroidals? You know, one, they both reduce your pain. Turmeric will actually re maybe reduce the disease processes going on in your body, but non steroidals increase disease processes in your body, things like um, gut ulcers, etc. Turmeric, no side effects. The, the data that I had was from 1999. There was about 12,000 hospitalisations due to the side effects of non steroidals and about 1,200 deaths in Australia due to, the, due to um, gastrointestinal bleeding and cardiovascular problems from non steroidals. No deaths from turmeric. Yet turmeric is taxed through GST. If you buy it as a medicine, you pay extra because you pay tax. The non steroidals are subsidised through the PBS. So turmeric will cost you about $30 and the non steroidals cost you about $5. So we have this, you know, I talked about funding models before, about the different barriers. This is one situation where, as a community, we subsidise a pharmaceutical that's quite dangerous. We pay, for it. we pay for it in other ways. We pay for it for our taxes and through the health bill and other things. Whereas tumouring, it's up to people to pay for it themselves. So there, are, there, there is still inequalities there. And this is another study that came out um, you know, early 2000s on the cost effectiveness. And this is where they looked at qualies and dallies. And they looked at the, the, num the amount of dollars um, it cost for a quality adjusted life year. And glucosamine, they didn't look at turmeric at that time, but they looked at glucosamine was between two and five thousand dollars per quality, which means it cost up to five thousand dollars to get one extra quality adjusted life year. Bracing surgery was also very effective because if you need a knee replacement, it can change your life. Um, exercise training was quite effective. Non steroidals were though not that eighty thousand to infinity dollars per quality. It goes to infinity when you die from the side effects. So the cost-benefit ratio, which is, this was done by econo economists, this is an econometric study, um, Leonie Siegel, who was at Monash with me at the time, um, did this. You know, there's you know, great wealth, you know, there's inequalities in the, the money, but you know, this is what we, we're told and this is what we're educated about. So none of you knew about Fighter Delore, I don't know how many knew about turmeric, but you all know about non -steroidals. So there's this idea of complementarity in medicine. Rather than complementary medicine, this is what I like to think of, complementarity. There's this yin and yang. There's the art and the science, theory and practice, mind and body. There's plants and pills. There's prevention and cure. There's personality versus technology. There's wellness focus versus illness focus. And we need to realise that a holistic approach is necessarily multidisciplinary. We need all the different disciplines to, to be, have a holistic approach to our health. And you know, there is this balance between the different paradigms, a biomedical model which is based on science and cure and illness and, and really government funding. Really at the moment that's the weightier um, form of medicine and the, the CAM model is more on the art of science, prevention and wellness and more public funding. So if you want that you have to go out and find it and do it yourself. And that you know, depends on where you live and which country that shifts either side. I mean, most of the world still uses herbal medicine. The WHO, the World Health Organization, says that 80% of the world use herbal medicine and complementary medicine as their standard form of medicine. It's just here in our you know, modern Western world that we think drugs are the, the mainstream and the other stuff's the alternative. So it really depends on your perspective. But what we do know is good medicine takes time. And I'll start to wind up. And that longer, time, longer consultation times, the more time you spend with a practitioner, the lower the cost, the better the health outcomes, the less litigation, the less prescriptions and the more lifestyle advice is given, and the more doctor and patient satisfaction. So the longer you spend with your doctor, you get, you know, you get better outcomes all round. However, the tragedy is, if you look at the length of consultation, if you look at the quality of health outcomes and the length of consultation, it goes up. The longer the, outcome, longer the consultation, the better the health outcome. If you look at the cost, it goes down. The longer the, the consultation, the lower the cost. But what current policy in Australia does, it pushes medicine that way. Doctors get paid more for shorter, out, for shorter consultations. 
So what we're, what we're actually, through policy, through incentives, we're pushing people towards high cost, low quality medicine. And that's an issue for all of us because we all pay for that either directly for our own pain and suffering or through our taxes or through the pain and suffering of our families and our communities. So there is, there is serious inequalities that need to be addressed. Now, this is not about complementary medicine or, or Western medicine, although this is the way the, um, the rebates are for Medicare and, and you know, often um, how medicine is funded. But at the moment, as I say, we pay, we pay practitioners more for shorter consultations and we penalise them for long consultations. And that's the opposite direction for the evidence. So just to wind up, there's some factors to consider regarding complementary therapies. Now, they're generally used as complementary rather than alternative to conventional medicine. Um, there's generally insufficient evidence to strongly recommend or avoid a particular complementary therapy for most conditions. It's very rare that there's definitive evidence one way or the other. It's best to be open and honest and acknowledge that there's still much we, do not, we don't understand about potential benefits of many therapies. And that many therapies have a long tradition and an individual search for other approaches may be an important part of their personal growth. So when people try mindfulness or they try yoga or they try massage, that's often part of their own personal growth. And it shouldn't just be focused on just trying to fix this disease and an outcome. It's really look at the people as whole people. And finally, and this was mentioned, Linda mentioned this at the start, if a patient's right to choose different therapies is supported by a non-judgmental non-judgment, attitude and providing as much balanced information as possible, there's more likely to be a good therapeutic relationship. And that therapeutic relationship, whether it's with a complementary therapist or a doctor, is the most powerful tool we have. As I say, it's all about connection. And ultimately, medicine is an art that's informed by science. So don't let people say medicine is a science, because the science changes. It used to be leeches were you know, the best science we had. But that direct human connection, that therapeutic relationship, is an art. So we need to be fully informed by science. We want to make sure that what we're doing is going to do more good than harm. But it's, it's up to each of us as individuals to decide what that's going to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was good. Thank you, Mark. That was great. Now, we're getting um, microphones being put at either side. If you've got a question for Mark, please make your way to one of the aisles to ask a question. Now, as we do that, I'd actually given Mark my question beforehand, but after seeing his talk, I'm going to now ask him a different question. <laughs> uh, the issue you had around touch really spoke to me, and um, uh, no matter how much I ask, I don't get as much massage from other people as I would like. Um, <laughs> can you... <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> uh, but I find self-massage using a, a little ball on the sole of my foot as, as a very useful for, for me. Did your rev, uh, review of massage look at self-massage? There was some self-massage. Well, yeah, there is study on self-massage. And I think, I mean, touch is so vitally important, but there are ways that we can, um, if, even if we don't have someone to massage us, we can use natural fibres next to our skin. Um, we can... You know, bathing, even in a bath where you're, you know, rather than, or even, and we're talking about showering, a lot of, um, I, I think, and this is, I've been, I've been doing a lot of work with the spa industry, but they talk about, you know, the shower you have in the morning is really not to get clean or in the evening, it's more about hydrotherapy. You want the, the feeling, you want the heat and you want the massage of the shower. That's about touch when we have a shower. Um, and, you know, in, in our low touch society, there's, you know, those, um, shoes you get, or even taking your feet off, your shoes off at home and walking barefoot at the, at the Peninsula Hot Springs, they have this uh, reflexology walk where they have stones along where you can actually just walk and feel. You know, because you know now we we literally um, ground, you know, we insulate ourselves from the earth. You know, we wear rubber soled shoes and you know we don't walk barefoot on the earth anymore. You now there's other benefits of that too. There's an electric connection you get, but that touch, that actually touching nature, touching each other, you know, hug, you know, talk about tree hugging, you know, just touching a tree. There's, there's so many ways you can bring touch into our lives. Now, therapeutic touch is a whole different thing. There's also self-massage, which, um, you know, that's a whole journey where you can study that because there's different acupuncture points and different points in the body we can stimulate or tap or, or massage for, for different conditions. So it's, um, 
You know, when you've got a, one of these human bodies, we didn't come with an instruction manual, so we need to learn about it as we go. And I'm amazed I do a practice called Five Rhythms Dance, which is a, a free dance practice. And at 52, I'm still finding new ways that I've never moved before. You know, the ways my body can move, like, well, I've never done that before. So I think, you know, we need to keep on stimulating our bodies. And I mean, as I say, touch is, a, is one of the most basic and often ignored um, senses that we have. Thanks for so your question. I'm still struggling to see people move to the microphones, so... Hi. Um, thanks very much for the speech. Um, uh, just as a point of clarity, uh, non-steroidal, are we talking Panadol and um, uh, ibuprofen? Um, yeah, yeah non-steroidal are the things like ibuprofen. Yeah. Panadol is paracetamol, which is a different class. Sure. So, and in fact, I was staggered at the, um, I was at the, the service station, you know, paying for my petrol the other day, and in front of me there's this whole wall of sugar, and then I looked to the right and there was a whole wall of non-steroidals. There was all the neurofins and ibuprofens and all the different, you know, um, over the counter. Now, you know, 20 years ago they, were, they had to be prescribed and now there's lower dose that are over the counter. So there are different classes of analgesics. So yeah, the, the ibuprofens and the neurofins, they're non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Panadol, panadine, they're either paracetamol and codeine combinations. And, and which re the second part of what I was going to ask you about, um, Logic, and I may be completely wrong here, um, seems to me that uh, if you're going to take something like that uh, for, say, neck pain or mm -hmm. joint pain or whatever, um, that that drug is going to affect all sorts of elements of your body, your liver, your kidneys, you know, the, the little toe you might also have in pain and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you've got a pain in a specific area, let's say your knuckles from arthritis, wouldn't it be better for the entire body if the solution that you were using was localised, as in a topical treatment, mm -hmm. because you're not therefore poisoning your toe or giving your kidneys trouble? Is that a reasonable assumption? Well, or? preferably you don't poison any part of your body. So you say you're taking curcumin from turmeric that stimulates every part of your body so that you know, it, it doesn't have, it's got positive side effects as opposed to negative side effects. So it, you know, it helps prevent Alzheimer's disease and helps prevent, you know, cardiovascular disease and cancer and diabetes. So it's got all these positive effects. But you're right, if you've got a local problem, you can often use local solutions. And the study I mentioned briefly that, that I actually conducted on um, arthroate, which was a camphor glucosamine chondroitin cream, was topical. But then, even in that study, I mean, it was, we did a double-blind study. We had to scent the placebo and everything. But when you're doing topical, you're getting touch as well. That's self-massage. So I think a lot of the benefit of the topical um, therapy is you're actually getting from that self-massage and that self-stimulation. But you, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you don't want to... Um, and certainly for non-steroidal, you don't want to beat them on long, on long term because they do... And that was the Better Health Channel saying, you know, on the shortest period... Um, possible and really for treating acute pain for a, a small time. They can be really effective for that. But for something like that's chronic long term disease like osteoarthritis, you no, know, it's really best to avoid them. <coughs> Mark, Mark, thanks for a very interesting presentation. You mentioned before APRA, which is the Australian Health Practitioner Regulatory Agency. Mm -hmm. Can people take a reassurance if they're looking for various practitioners if someone is registered with APRA? Does that sort of help guide choices these days? Well, APRA is really about the disciplines, not about the therapy. So, you know, doctors and nurses and psychologists and osteopaths and chiropractors and Chinese medicine practitioners and podiatrists and pharmacists, they're all APRA-registered professions. So APRA governs the profession. So you can't be a doctor or a pharmacist that's not APRA-registered. But there are other professions like naturopathy or massage therapy or many complementary therapies that aren't registered with APRA. And some of them have their own professional associations or self-regulation. Um, but even... So APRA does give you a certain standard and, you know, the board... Like, I, I teach at RMIT now, and in our school, we teach osteo, chiro, Chinese medicine, nursing, psychology, and all the different... art. And when you graduate, you get a stamp by APRA that you're a psychologist or a nurse or a midwife or a, a chiropractor, etc. But I teach a wellness program there's no registration for wellness practitioners. Um, and even within the, the disciplines, you get rogue GPs and you get awesome GPs. You get rogue chiros and you get awesome chiros. So I think, as I say, you get the patient, the practitioner often you deserve. 
So ARPA has a standard, but really what, what the ARPA does, it gives you a complaints mechanism. So if you are damaged or you have a problem, you can actually call up ARPA and they can reprimand the practitioner. If they're outside of ARPA, often there's no reprimand or complaints, but it doesn't give you really an assurity of the quality of any individual practitioner. And I think you're much better off using that criteria of you know, their, your personal preference, the rapport that you have with them, their access to you, you know, how accessible they are for you, and the, and the team that they work with. I think often they're much better indicators whether they've got a stamp from a registration board. But that's my personal opinion. magnesium in tablet form mm -hmm. and I've found that there's a powder. Is it more effectively absorbed in the body by taking it in, in water as well, a powder? Well, actually, the most effective way to take magnesium is through your skin at the hot springs. Um, <laughs> um, or, or, there are, or in a bath and you can buy magnesium salts. So Epsom salt and there's magnesium chloride salts. So you actually absorb magnesium much better through your skin than you will orally. Um, whether it's a powder or a capsule depends on what else you've got in your stomach and the dissolution time, etc. Um, I mean, the powders are, I think, you know, they're effective, but you won't absorb as much um, orally as you will just for your skin. So, and, and you can actually get um, creams and sprays that you can put on your skin. So if you have a topical um, problem, you can actually spray it on that area, but it, you'll absorb it systemically. Leg cramps. So you can actually get the creams and put it directly oh, on your legs. Um, but it, you know, magnesium is, most people are magnesium deficient, funnily enough. So it's something we all, we all need, um, but it is absorbed much better um, topically than orally. And health food shop or chemist? Yeah, yeah my, I mean, most good health food shops will have a range of, I mean, okay. Epsom salts, you know, magnesium sulfate or magnesium chloride salts, yeah. Epsom okay. salts Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Thank you. Over here, we've got two oh. questions and back here. I was just wondering what your latest evidence is on um, infrared soreness. You've, you've mentioned spas, but what's, yeah. what's the latest on infrared soreness? Um, in fact, I've got a PhD student now who's a medical doctor who I met with earlier today who's doing her whole thesis on saunering. And um, saunering's great. The infrared heat is great. It actually absorbs into your body. Sweating is really important for our health. Most of the research on saunas, though, has been, has been shown for cardiovascular benefits. So when you go into a sauna, because it's hot and you sweat, your heart's pumping harder, all your um, vessels are dilated, so you know, your, all your blood vessels are open. So your heart's pumping hard with all blood vessels, that, which is what would happen when you're running you know, or doing full exercise. But you can be sitting there listening to music or chatting with your friends, and just like you can in a hot spring, and your heart's pumping, and you get tired afterwards. Um, so there is quite a, a lot of research showing that there is cardiovascular benefits. The research we're doing is more on the um, detoxification benefits, what comes out in the sweat. You know, can you release plastics or pesticides and things in your sweat? And you know, how does it differ in different parts of the body? And whether it's infrared sauna or normal traditional sauna, there's not a lot of research that compares the two. But infrared saunas, um, you sweat uh, more at a lower temperature, so you can tolerate it better. Because to sweat a lot from a normal sauna, you actually get, have to get a lot hotter and infrared heat actually absorbs into your body deeper and causes sweating at a lower temperature. So would you say it's a good complementary medicine? Oh. Well, again, you know, and we're doing a, we're doing a global sauna survey because some people sauna because it's a social thing. Some people sauna because it's part of their culture or their lifestyle. In Finland, they all sauna. Other people sauna because another one of my PhD students is an Olympic gold medalist, um, Lauren Burns, who who did Taekwondo and they used to, they had to sauna to reach the weight or jockeys or sports where they have to reach a weight, they sauna. Um, other people do it for um, weight loss, other people do it for detoxification. So it can be like, like turmeric, is it a food, is it a medicine? Depends on why you're doing it, if you're trying to treat something it's a medicine. Otherwise it's, it's part of a good, I mean sweating is a good part of anybody's lifestyle. So I'd encourage you to sweat as much as you can. Hi, excellent insights, thank you. Uh, clearly, we're, if we re we've got to start with a diagnosis. Um, if we're suspecting OA which, or other arthritic issues, um, it's best to get an MRI. Like, there's so many scans and, you know, we can forever be trawling, you know, the medicos 
looking, is it best just to nip it in the bud, get an MRI through a surgeon and then work back? Um, it's, um, I mean, getting imaging, I mean, the imaging's improved amazingly in the last two decades. But with something like osteoarthritis, there's not a direct relationship between the, the actual damage and the clinical symptoms. So you can have someone with really looks bad on an X-ray and they're fine. The other person, you don't, they don't see much on an X-ray and they're they're suffering terribly. Right. So there's not a, a, a really straightforward relationship. I mean, it's good to get a diagnosis so it's not something else that's more treatable. But osteoarthritis is generally it's a degenerative, on you know, chronic disease. So it's good to get a diagnosis and it's a plain X-ray is probably enough. Um, even though symptoms sometimes extend in inflammation around the tissue, which is more, sometimes more of the issue than the joint itself. Well, in, I mean, on a plain x-ray, you can look at synovial thickening and you can look at joint destruction and, and you know, um, joint space narrowing and certain markers on x-ray. Um, I mean, it depends on an individual case if you want to look at so, so, so the So what disability. would you recommend if it was you? Well, it's, it's really hard. I mean, I've got, I've got osteoarthritis. 40 years ago, I had a skiing accident. I had the cartilage removed in my knee, and then 10 years later, I had the cartilage removed in my other knee. I was playing squash. Um, what, gives so, you know, the best, I, um, what gives the best reading information? Well, osteo so what is MRI? The best? What gives the best information on well, for for inflammation? Tissue, you can do a blood test. Joint. So MRI, MRI will give you an image. Inflammation is a sort of a biochemical okay. assessment where you can do with a blood test. But it really depends on the joint, and if, if the question then comes, do you need to replace that joint or not, you know, arthroplasty or... Arth or, you know. To, or to see how much uh, 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 cartilage has been, has disappeared or... Again, I, I don't... It's not so important to see how much is there or not, because that's... It's what's more important is how you feel and how, what you can do. And that's so not necessarily as, related to what you see yeah. on the image. So the question is, as a preventative, if I want to try and nip in the bud anything that's going to further kill the cartilage as a preventative, I've got to start with some do's and don'ts. So is, it, is an x-ray sufficient or will I best get... X-ray or MRI won't prevent anything. What no. will prevent things is healthy diet. There's anti-inflammatory diets you can take, having things like turmeric in your everyday diet, having um, as much movement as you can comfortably, so moving your body, enjoying the movement of your body, they're all the things you can do for prevent on that sense approach, right. you know, stress management, exercise, nutrition. Imaging and testing, it gives you a snapshot of one image at one point in, in time that doesn't re really relate to clinical symptoms. So, I mean, it's nice to have to say, yes, I've got a diagnosis, but it, it's actually not going to change anything. But there are some things that clearly you need to stop doing to avoid um, The x-ray won't tell you that. You know, you know what no. you need to stop doing. Stop doing them. And the things you need to do, you know, have some more saunas, have some good food, get some massage. Eat good okay. food. So, I mean, I'm not trying to say don't get the x-ray, but it's not to, to rely on x-ray to tell you what to do or not. It's putting more, in, you know, giving the x-ray more credibility than it probably has. Okay. Thank you. We'll give it a shot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. One question here, and this will be the last one over this side. Um, I'm just interested in um, the turmeric curcumin. Can you also take fish oil with that? Because fish oil seems to have lost its flavour in favour well, of... The... It's important when you take turmeric or curcumin that you have a f source of fat. Right. Um, and again, you know, you're talking about a recipe for curry or you're talking about a popcorn recipe or you're talking about for me medicinal use. So there's this food side and there's this medicine side. Now, in the medicine side, there's some that's... that's I mean, certainly you can take them together. They, turmeric doesn't interact and it's safe. Um, and turmeric may be more effective when it's taken with things like fat or black pepper even that that take helps the capsule. absorption. So it's in the capsule. I'd take it with a meal or with some other fat. The capsule may be formula, like the, there was a product there, Theracurmin, which is nanoparticularised with some oil in it, so it's very highly bioavailable. But then for those special formulations, they're more medicinal, but they're also more expensive. You know, to go on them every day, you're going to pay more. Whereas if you have it as part of your diet and you put some fat and other spices and spice up your cooking a bit, that's a prevention approach, which may also help you. But so it depends really what your intention is to take it. What are you trying to treat? And that's maybe where an end of one study can be effective. And my other quick question is stem cell. That seems to be something in particular with osteoporosis or osteoarthritis. What, what are your thoughts well, on that? Well, that's the holy grail, isn't it? That we can put a stem cell in and grow new joints, um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and revive. I mean, that, that's, 
yeah, there's, I wouldn't, that's not in the realms of complementary therapies. That's much more into you know, high technology therapies. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that it's at the level that I'd start recommending it for, you know, for general use. Um, but you know, that's the promise. Who knows, in the next you know, decade or two, um, we may be growing new joints rather than using titanium. Who knows? Thank you. And the last question over here. Um, I really welcomed your talking about the importance of the therapeutic relationship as well as, you know, what kind of complementary medicines people can take. And it seems to me that's important not just in the kind of one-to-one -one relationship, whether it's with a doctor or an acupuncturist, but in lots of other kind of relationships like in exercise, etc. that through the nature of that relationship you can convey confidence and enthusiasm to people, which makes a huge difference in their take-up of different kinds of approaches. And given that you work in an academic setting, I'm interested as to whether you think that that kind of therapeutic relationship can be taught to people and to what degree as opposed to that it's innate and that some people are therefore going to be more naturally healers or whatever than other people are. Oh, I think it can certainly be taught. In fact, I think it, sometimes it's taught out. I think naturally, you know, we go into those relationships, and as children, we're naturally, you know, bonding with other people, and then we get sort of socialised out of that. You know, don't talk to strangers, and don't do that, and and then we have to rediscover what's our innate sort of nature to connect, because I think that is part of our innate human um, desire, and you know, it's part of who we are is that we want to connect. Um, but certainly, communication skills, and, and I, I, I teach a course now to chiros, osteos, and Chinese medicine students about clinical communication and about um, you know, the, the privilege of being a practitioner where if you come to me, you know, I'm bound by a you know, doctor-patient confidentiality, but I can talk to you about anything. I can talk to you about you know, your weirdest sexual desires or what the colour of your vomit is or, 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 the, or the abuse you suffered as a child or as a refugee. Or, you know, there's no areas that aren't prohibited in terms of talking about the most intimate parts of your life that you might not share with anyone else. And those conversations often are really powerful, but they also enrich your life as a practitioner. So I think um, that, that relationship is quite sacred. Um, it can be taught, but um, and Patria King talks about this beautifully, saying that as practitioners, um, we're only able to hear what we're comfortable hearing because patients sort of suss you out. And if you're not comfortable talking about sexual issues or you know refugee um, trauma or you know survivors of abuse. If you're not comfortable to hear it, the patient's not going to tell you. They'll pick it up in your body language or you know, the questions you ask. But if you're open to hear it, people will share their souls to you and they'll tell them the most intimate parts of their life and be so grateful for it. Um, so it, it is a skill. It's quite challenging because it requires personal growth on the part of the practitioner um, and being present as a practitioner. But as, as, as I say, it's, um, I think it's the most potent thing we have as practitioners is who we are rather than what we necessarily do. Thank you, Mark. I'll just, in a moment, I'll ask Linda Martin to come up and give a vote of thanks to Professor Cohen. But first, I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd also like to thank those of you who came up and asked questions. If you're like me, you've probably got a lot of things running through your head and a lot of issues to think through taking control of your own health. One of the ways we hope we can assist is with the information that we have available at Move Muscle, Bone and Joint Health. Out the front, you'll find a suite of information sheets. They're also available on our website. And you'll also find a little card with our helpline. We have rheumatology nurses who have a wealth of experience and we have peer support workers who are able to assist you, your friends or anyone you know who has a muscle, bone and joint condition. Now Move Muscle, Bone and Joint Health is a not-for-profit organisation and we would really appreciate your assistance. If you are not a member, there are membership forms out the front and with your help and support we can all make a move to better health and I will now ask Linda Martin to, make a vote, uh, to give a vote of thanks to Professor Cohen. Well, I hope you all feel good after Professor Cohen's presentation tonight. Very informative and engaging. 
and uh, I guess we're all going out to a disco afterwards and going to go home and give someone a hug. <laughs> I, I was very interested to hear that uh, Australia's been a leader in, in this area, for example, in the recognition and registration of practitioners, although there's obviously a few areas that he mentioned where we have to uh, make, make a move to be at the forefront rather than running behind. He reminded us that medicine has one aim, and that's to reduce human suffering. That's very much in line with the purpose of our organisation MOVE, um, which is to make sure we improve the quality of life of, of people who have muscle, bone and joint conditions or people who are at risk of developing them. I think we do need to sort out the kept and the unkept promises that you talked about and evidence associated with all sorts of medicines, be they complementary or traditional. And we are all uh, very interested in seeing further research in these areas. Recent research that we've done um, has demonstrated clearly the interest our consumers have in complementary therapy. It's a treatment um, that they want to be able to choose and they want to understand better. In this context, MOVE wants to be that trusted source of knowledge and Ben has spoken to you about our helpline. It's a free service. Uh, we really encourage you to use it and also to have a look at our website. Um, I, I thank Professor Cohen for also mentioning our partnership with Peninsula Hot Springs. If you're actually a MOVE member, you will get a discount when you go down to the Hot Springs. And I had a lovely Sunday there with my, uh, with my daughter last Sunday. Uh, we do have some special events there which are dine and bathe, and uh, they're coming up shortly. So talk to uh, my staff as you leave. So I want you to thank you all for coming tonight, to encourage you to get connected with our new organisation and to help us be a very loud voice for muscle, bone and joint health. Thanks for coming and thanks to Professor Cohen. <laughs>